Welcome back, everyone, to Towards a Metapsychology that is True to Transformation. And once again, I am joined by my friends and um, co-dialoguers, um, Greg Enriquez and Zach Stein. Gentlemen, you want to say hello? Hey, hey good to be back. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. So last time we, we, we went to the depths of, you know, the, the the transformation, the juncture between is and ought. And we, we really sort of, you know, problematized the largely unquestioned is, ought, I mean, in general, uh, unquestioned is ought uh, distinction. And we called it seriously into question and then we kept going deeper and deeper into that. And now, and, and, and that got us to some fundamental points. And now in, in, in a corresponding and relevantly corresponding fashion, we're going to do a zoom out um, and uh, somebody who's really good at zooming out while not losing a grip on the zoom in is Greg Enriquez because he, he, uh, he does it uh, very systematically and very clearly in a powerful way. And so I'm going to now turn things over to Greg. Wonderful. Uh, thanks you. Uh, thanks to you both uh, for joining me in this, uh, this particular episode. Um, you know, I corralled you both into this uh, so that we could, uh, because for me, I mean, I've really enjoyed the arc of this conversation. Uh, we opened it up on the problematization and transformation. We articulated why Mac mainstream psychology is not really up to the task. Um, we articulated why it's such a crucial interdisciplinary issue. And then Zach, of course, has led us through uh, a beautiful articulation of the core human dimensions in relationship to steeped in an educational and developmental psychological philosophical view that's rich and broad. And then we brought our views to that to articulate, hey, how do we reflectively analyze this? And then most recently on the is ought problem to show, I think what we've embodied is a dialogos and a metapsychological perspective on some of core fundamental issues that are relevant to us as individuals, relative to us as society. Um, but I wanted to have a final articulation of the metapsychology angle um, as we return to sort of the problematization of what psychology is that we did in uh, earlier in the thing because it's sort of you know that this is an obsession of mine what is psychology and its problem uh, and I don't know and I wanted to just spend some time articulating having us together uh, the three of us I think uh, afford a really unique to sort of say okay what is psychology in relationship to this meta psychology um, and what's the What's the subject matter of psychology? What's its institution? Where are we in philosophy? Um, if the field had a frame, a clear identity, I think that a, at least the identity that I would like to afford it, its relationship between all of the questions that we've engendered, the descriptive explanatory questions, the ought questions, the application, the bridge to education, the bridge to society, um, would afford itself a lot more clarity than at least the current architecture that the institution of psychology is arranged in. And so I'd like to, for us to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then what I'd like to do is as I back up into that, I then have stumbled into or built a connection uh, with some yogic philosophies um, that I really find to be very, very fascinating. And maybe some of the synergy between that, uh, and I know Zach, you're familiar with it, and John, you're familiar with it in a way, but then be like, hey, there may be an opportunity to really afford us a metaphysics that puts together a third person exterior epistemology with a first person interior epistemology in a novel way. And that could provide the architecture perhaps to really ground uh, our core is all justifications for what we're after. Um, so that's what, that's what I'd like uh, to articulate. So if you recall the episode where we talked about the problemization of psychology, you know, I basically, uh, delineated the field as thusly. Um, it comes, for me, the word psychology has to be anchored in the context of modern natural science. Uh, of course, you can articulate it from a wide variety of different ways, but if we're talking about it in the context of the institutional identity that sits in the context of our current academic institutions and affords its identity in that regard, at the very least, we have to ask What's its rooted implication in relationship to nat modern natural science? Um, and to the extent that that fails, I think the, the enterprise of psychology is in trouble, uh, at least at any coherent level. 
Um, and to the extent that it gets absorbed by a pure natural science view, that's a very dangerous view as well. So I think that psychology has got to sit uh, with a foot in the natural sciences that bridge into the social sciences and then into the humanities and philosophy. That's where I see, and it's really is this kind of central hub discipline. The current way the field organized itself was to try to apply, at least in the Western tradition, uh, Western European tradition and the America's tradition, is to try to apply various frames to a specialized different aspects of mind uh, to then uh, uh, explore them through the methods and epistemologies of science, okay? Which means external observation, measurement, research organizations that try to build stacks of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about the actual schools of thought then as specializing different aspects of the field of mind, either behavioral responses, uh, functional mental life, internal uh, systems of consciousness, uh, human justification at a higher level, depending. And then you get a breakdown of schools of thinking. Uh, they can't, by the 1920s, Vygotsky critiques this, says, oh my God, it's a nightmare. They never fix it. Uh, and then we have the, you know, the cognitive revolution comes along. That adds some ontological, generalizable, weak computational possibilities, at least for mainstream psychology. But essentially, you get a weak neurocognitive functionalism tied to a scientific method, really epistemology that gives you your methodological behavioral approach. And then you get about 5% of the field, at least in uh, America's doing radical behaviorism. So you get this methodological versus radical behavioral institution that says, hey, we apply science to solve your, your knowledge problems on behavior and mental process. Okay. Um, so what I want to then say is that that that's a completely inadequate, as I said. And, and then I want to talk a little bit about what's a much more adequate way of operating. And, you know, I bring then the tree of knowledge to afford a new vision uh, for a naturalistic ontology. Um, so the tree of knowledge then, it conforms to a standard natural science view, sort of a common sense natural science view of cosmic evolution. I would say that's the kind of the broad scientific view now is it, you know, a, a, an extreme physical reductionism, I would say, is in the minority. You basically get a non-physical reductionism into emergence. That's the standard view. Um, and I would, I would call sort of big history an exemplar of the san standard view of sort of common sense interdisciplinary science. You start at the Big Bang. Big Bang gives rise to particles, and that gives rise to atoms. That gives rise to chemistry. It also gives rise to scale like stars. Then we could fail that up and we said life then happens, at least in our particular planet. Life gets small at first and then it's big. And then all of a sudden, you know, down the road, we get humans and then humans explode into a new culture. That's the big history model. Okay. Um, I argue that that's the, the time by complexity uh, axes, the time by, I would say, complexification. <laughs> Thanks to John, I use that word more, uh, I think it's more precise, is right, uh, but it's not it doesn't articulate the proper ontology, okay? The proper ontology uh, is really understanding that there are fundamentally different levels of complexification at one, like within matter. And so that's a jump from particles to atoms to chemistry. That's a, those are levels of complexification. And you can demonstrate levels of emergence and emanation across scale, like solar systems may organize themselves in particular kind of ways. But those kinds of emergences are radically different than the jump that happens at the level of life. Okay? Uh, and fundamentally, the reason for that is the way life stores information, <clears throat> cells process that information, cells communicate with each other, and then uh, generate a variation selection and retention process that affords a complexity building feedback loop and gives rise to a new fundamentally different pattern of behavioral entities living processes. Um, so, and the nature of that is sort of, you use the word supervene on it. I don't really like that term, whatever. We can talk about it in a number of different ways, but it's a higher, fundamentally higher order level of complex adaptive organization. Okay. Um, and then I, and that's big, that's exactly what big history says, but big history then just jumps from there to humans. Okay. Uh, as many different models do many biological, physical uh, list and biological models basically see life, and then they go from life all the way up to humans. All right, uh, I think that's a, a that's a big mistake because they miss mindedness, 
They miss the emergence of mind, uh, what I would call capital M mind, which I believe emerges from the same basic uh, emergence and emanation feedback loops uh, that have at least massive parallel, meaning it's the emergence of an information processing and communication system that affords a higher level of self-organization. So the nervous system ties together bodies, complex or multi-celled systems, and then affords the capacity for a sensory motor loop that enables their behavior as a pattern whole. And all of our vocabularies about animal behavior, hey, that thing, you know, that gazelle's running away from that uh, lion and that li that's food for the lion. All of that, I would argue, is a particular level of complex functional analysis, okay? That's radically different than we see uh, in the living world in all the other kingdoms, as complex and interesting as they are. And I think that the proper definition for that is mental, meaning that it's an adjective that describes the kind of complex adaptive behavior that animals with complex active bodies, nervous systems behave in relationship to the environment. Okay? Why did I spend all that time in that? Because actually what that's basically doing is it's affording us an ontology of the, the mental, the beginning of mental is at the emergence of a nervous system with a complex active body at the Cambrian explosion. And now that's basically saying, when we say behavior and mental process, that could mean 6 million different things. Ask Rene Descartes, ask George Romanos, ask any number of people, they mean radically different things. And we don't have a shared understanding of what we mean by the mental. This affords a joint point in nature that's as clear, almost I would argue, as clear as the joint point between matter and life. Everyone in society and science has always agreed. It's like, hey, there's shit that's inanimate and there's shit that's animate. And man, that's a big difference. And you need some sort of science. Now, how reductive and all this other stuff. But there's never been any doubt that the general concern with biology is to circle the broad domain of life. You can debate exactly the essences that define it. But in terms of a category of family resemblances, there's no debate about what the general territory is around what you're circling. Okay. Psychology lacks that. That's the, the, my, uh, my basic point is, is that the science of psychology, because people have so many different definitions of consciousness, of psyche, of human, of animal, and there's so much ambiguity in nature and receiving the taxonomy, we have not been able to afford ourselves clarity. Um, the tree of knowledge affords a particular opportunity for Christmas and clarity, and it says that we should divide the line in relationship to the Cambrian explosion we should have an animal mental dimension of complexification that gets identified and associated with the what people just call animal behavior it actually should just be called animal mental behavior mm -hmm. and that is then grants one level of ontology and thus and thus there's a dividing line in our systematic ways of thinking that says oh that's what biology is the layer beneath that Neuroscience is a layer in between, a hybrid discipline between biology and psychology. And psychology concerns itself with the behavior of the animal as a whole at that level. Okay. That's the basic comparative psychology. The same basic logic then, and we've obviously been discussing this in many different areas, follows the evolution of animals, insects, invertebrates, into vertebrates, into mammals, et cetera. And then we get to primates, and then we get to our shared intersubjective, and then we get symbols, and then we get propositional language, and then boom, you get a human mind big bang that generates a culture layer on top of that. What does that mean? It means that we're now in a totally different layer of behavior, of mental behavioral process. You know? There's a propositional cultural socialization layer on top of what was the embodied layer. Okay? And I would argue then that now you're getting a radically different kind of behavioral process. So behavior and mental processes have two totally different fields that we have not separated. One's the base animal mental in relationship to our experience, that's the primate. And then there is the person, which is the justificatory propositional self-reflective narrative. And that's a radically different field of behavior, okay? What does that mean? It means that the institution of psychology should be divided between its base comparative and it's human. Human psychology becomes a fundamentally different subset institutionally than the basic psychology. Okay? Uh, and it's as different as you know, neuroscience now is now seen as a different, it's sort of branch of biology, but neuroscience is a hybrid. It sits in a hybrid between psychology and the biological sciences. Human psychology should sit as a hybrid between psycho base psychology and the social sciences. Okay. Um, 
And what should happen is human cognitive science, what John is an expert in, should then be merged effectively connected with human personality. Um, and then that should be connected effectively with social psychology and developmental psychology, uh, human developmental psychology. And that should perform, perform a coherent base on which then provides a potential ground for a totally different class of sciences, the, the social sciences. Okay. And so what this gives you is a natural into human, and then human is organized in a, at that particular level. And then you get the social sciences, which actually the human and social sciences, because of the double hermeneutic, provide create a whole nother set of complexifications, which we were talking about is and all, because the descriptions of the human and the nature of other types of things like artificial technology and other kinds of issues that merge at the behavior pattern create then a need to break the philosophy of social science as separate from the philosophy of natural science. Okay. So, so to me, what, what's all that? And then I'll, I'll say a few other things and I'll stop. That's the descriptive explanatory bridge of natural into social, which places psychology in a, in this hub place where basic connects down into biology and then human connects up. And then that connects into social sciences. The justification line is unbelievably crucial, both for the ontological description of what we do. My dog, Benji, has not been following this conversation well, <laughs> okay? What we do in relationship to our behavior and the implications of philosophy like on is and ought, like studying rats and dogs is fundamentally different than studying persons. It's simply at the level of the way we describe them, there's no feedback. Uh, it has all sorts of implications. I'm gonna ethically treat them, but there's no way you describe a rat and its behavior in a maze is totally different than the way we describe humans, okay? And then the implications for society. So the fact value distinction is completely different uh, and much more convoluted because of the feedback loops in relation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's that. And then the final distinction that I would make is then from the base attempt to describe and explain the animal, mental, and culture person level of the human and social psych, uh, then the issue of like, what do we do with that knowledge to make desired difference in the world? The, both the application in general, like application to education, application to industrial organization, sport psychology, application to psychopathology, all of those actually are clustered of normative, ontological, confusing, thick concepts that we talked about last time. And there's the development of like, you know, a licensed clinical psychologist that's a psychological doctor that enters in and says, hey, what are we going to do? To me, the profession of psychology then is a third institutional infrastructure, okay? So it should be very similar to medicine and biology, that relation. But in the world, we only have psychology, <laughs> psychologists and psychologists. And that term refers to academics uh, and it refers to professional practitioners. Uh, there's no clear identity. And if you look at the history of the American Psychological Association, it's constantly been battling over the last century about what's its core identity. And it landed on the idea that it was both because that's what psychology did. It created an, a basically a vacuum of confusion. And then it decided the amalgamation of concepts should just jump into that vacuum and we'll be everything to everybody. We'll both be a science and a profession. We'll deal with nerve systems. We'll deal with culture. Um, so my point of it is, is that uh, my meta-psychological view, uh, and then I'll shut up, see if there's anything to say, because then I want to tie it to Aurobindo, but basically is there should be three fundamental branches of the field, a basic comparative psychology that essentially overlaps with ethology and behavioral ecology, a human psychological branch that essentially overlaps a lot with human cognitive science, and then into development personality into, and extends into social. And those are tasked with describing and explaining in kind of a scientific epistemological way. However, the demands of the human sit in a social science epistemology, onto epistemology, which is different than a natural, pure, more base natural science. Okay. And then finally, there's a jump to a different task because actually of the value requirements of an application and profession, where you're actually tasked as a professional not to describe and explain change but to affect it, okay? Now to describe and explain change, has to, you have to have ethics and you have to have epistemic value clearly. But then to say, hey, this, is, this person that comes to you is suffering and they're bad in some way and they all agree. And then your task is to decide what's, way, what's a healthier, more mature, more adaptive, more better way to live. That requires yet another whole layer of expectation 
uh, and a whole other layer of valuation in relationship to the judgments that you need to make um, in a whole set of training where it's a different uh, you know, task to be a behavioral scientist as opposed to being a clinician. So those are the three great branches, I would argue, in terms of from an institutional perspective, given where we're situated now, is it would afford sort of integrity, clarity of in the institution. I'll stop there, see if any, if you guys have reactions or questions to that, because then I'm on a bridge then uh, to the Aurobindo stuff. But that's the map that I wanted to, so from a meta psych view, hey, what's the institution look like? Here's a logic for the institution. Um, I'm quite familiar with this. Yep. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't. I don't have much right now novel to say. Okay. Uh, and I mean, we did a lot of work at the more fine grain level in the in you know in the untangling the world knot and right. the elusive eye. Uh, and right. you, know, you demonstrated, uh, you know, in continual practice the ability to apply this framework in a really uh, fecund manner. Um, so. Uh, yeah, but this, this seems to me uh, exactly also what Zach wants, which is, you know, the articulation of metapsychology is going in a lockstep with the articulation of your ontology. And so the questions are constantly bouncing off each other and answering each other. And so um, um, I think that's, um, I think that's one of the great advantages of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, you and I've had a private discussion about the mental and the cognitive, and I, I like how that, you know, how that was, how that was, has been resolved. Um, so, yeah, I sort of. Yeah, no, I'm sorry if it was redundant at all, but it's. Just, oh, no, 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 it's not necessarily redundant. No, no, the apology is from me. I'm sure for many people watching this, it's not redundant. Uh, I just wanted to indicate that um, my lack of having something novel to say is, is because I've had a lot of opportunity right, to question and, and dialogue with you about this. That's why. Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, Greg, because I think, I mean, I agree. I've heard, I've heard you and I've read, uh, read you uh, on this. And I think a lot about the way the psychology as a field was not institutionalized the way that other sciences were institutionalized. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit like the poor kid on the block or something, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so and we've talked about physics and me and things of that nature, but, you know, the uh, kind of um, need to, and I've talked about this, reify certain forms of professional practice and certain forms of institutional practice quite early, I'm talking like World War I, mm -hmm. <laughs> when measurement in particular uh, became the dominant way that psychology moved through the you know industrial organizational psych and educational testing and these things <clears throat> were, were, were very large enterprises very early that mm -hmm. employed many 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 psychologists um, oh. and uh, and so similarly you've had the growth of psychiatry which needs to be mentioned um, which is you know the use of uh, you know, pharmaceutical drugs to affect yep. behavior. Um, and so that also is one of the ways that there's been a kind of uh, movement towards a institutionalization of psychology that was kind of driven by market demand for certain types of things rather than by, let's say, principal ontological view of what the field like would actually ideally be structured like. And so if you can compare this to example, uh, for example, like, uh, I mean, maybe this is not a good example, but, you know, the application of physics through engineering in NASA mm -hmm. or something. Right. right. Totally. Uh, where you're, you're, you're designing something on the matter of the way it needs to be designed uh, under conditions of, I'm talking about like the moon, for example, where there was not a, where there was not a, uh, competitive institutional forms of scarcity that drive mm -hmm. certain reifications of scientific totally. fields. So this is what I'm saying. Psych psychology never had a chance to organize itself. Um, now, I will also say that other fields are in the same position. Like the, oh, dis yeah. the distortion of the institutionalization of science in general. Uh, there's a great book by this guy, David Nobel, because uh, called America by Design, where he talks mm. about you know, the wedding between the military industrial complex and many, many fields you wouldn't think <laughs> were actually tied in there, like Chomsky doing his linguistic work mm. and, uh, basically on the dole of the defense mm. contractors. I mean, 
UC Berkeley being built under that auspice in terms of its major scientific enterprises. And so there's just this way that, you know, so for example, the Hydron Collider, the Uh Hydron Collider, this Uh is the largest scientific project. It's the, some people say the largest project, largest cooperative project ever undertaken by humans ever. Uh The Hydron Collider. It's kind of interesting, right? Totally. Now, what is it doing? What is it proving? Mm. Like, right. how's it benefiting me? <laughs> <laughs> you got to know how the goddamn neutrons shatter. Well, right. And then there's this question <laughs> if it's deeply driven by certain theoretical assumptions, which some physicists think or not. Right. So I'm just, what I'm saying is that there's been an obvious <laughs> absence of emphasis on psychology and a cap mm-hmm. of... Oh of certain forms of institutional practice that could have emerged from the field of psychology. Um, And so the reemergence of the legalization of psychedelics, uh, Mm -hmm. a whole bunch of other things are kind of maybe moving us in directions that we forfeited when we decided to basically pursue physical science and technological engineering of the externalities and interconnections of human life rather than looking to explore inner space if i can use a cheesy metaphor that's a, no that's actually that's actually a beautiful transition so what i'd like to then say is that that we're out of time between worlds somebody told me that i don't remember where i heard that I guess. <laughs> yeah. but not, but i mean you know and so we're re- reinventing ourselves we need an axial age bronze age kind of revolution at some level and maybe we can get uh, the intellectual alignment correct and that's where i'm so excited about a potential psychology at least that lays out an intellectually coherent argument that then bridges physics biology psychology and the social sciences into the application um, with a degree of integrity and coherence that allows us to get a grip on the real and grip on a real in a way that fulfills us, uh, you know. Um, so what I'd now like to do then is just talk about my own narrowness in terms of the way I get trained. Uh, so I get trained as an experimental, I mean, not, you know, empiricist, certainly, uh, that, the, that the right justified level of knowledge is through the behavior exterior. You observe stuff, you measure shit, okay? And so, and I, I carry that history, but I'm breaking out of it in a particular way. Um, but it, it grounded me in terms of sort of what was legitimate and what was not a priori in many different domains. That science had a particular kind of epistemic and really justified authority about what could legitimize what was, you know, okay. Um, and that I'll bring that home to the here and now because, for example, as I you know, emerge with my system, I was like, well, this is really anchored in science. And then people are like, hey, you should check out Wilbur. And I'm like, well, Wilbur, you know, (laughs) is he really anchored into an actual naturalistic ontology? Um, And so I would use that to be kind of dismissive. Uh, And along those lines, uh, you know, I got a book in 2010, uh, actually this book, I picked it up at just a greater psychology, the psychology of Sri Aurobindo. Um, and in, when I first read this book in 2010, where I was still in the process of writing my book, and I was growing a little bit in relationship to the inadequacies of the standard empirical program, and of course, I've always been arguing, you know, I was in it still at that time, that we just need good meta-theoretical organization, this paradigm's relatively healthy. Um, but over the last 10 years, there's really been a fundamental shift about the magnitude of the inaccuracy of the modernist paradigm and its capacity to appropriately evolve from the principles that it's actually grounded in. Um, uh, and, that, and that's reflected in my own continued alienation about the inability of the system, at least in my own, obviously it's egocentric, it's like, here's a fucking model that's actually 10 times better than the chaotic organization that you have. And every individual or conversation you have, and everybody nods along with it. And yet you can't leverage the system at all to move in a coordinated fashion. And in part, because the theoretical argument that I was making actually is like your commitment to empiricism that you've actually institutionalized and the way you get all your grants is kind of, you know, weak. <laughs> I mean, at least a huge amount of fucking chaos and enormous amount of popular, wasted not energy. Not a popular view, Greg. Not That's a not a popular view. view. People are like, okay, and behind the scenes, actually, it's a popular view. People are actually, oh my God, I always feared that this was a useless enterprise. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who say that, you know, yet at an institutional level, there's no real capacity of the system basically to be like, oh my God, we have to actually stop first principles and you know, what are you gonna do? Retract all the damn textbooks? 
it's a nightmare. So, but anyway, so then I get more and more alienated from the structure, even though, I'm, you know, both my parents are professors, I get embedded in the academy. It's like, God, what the hell is this? So the bottom line story that, and so then obviously I shift and go crazier and build gardens and things like that as just sort of different alternatives. And my own consciousness begins to shift uh, significantly in relationship to the, really the harmony essentially between an exterior empiricism and an interior empiricism um, capacity, but at the same time, more and more alienation. And as you know, John and others sort of like kind of transformed, did some wisdom energy transformation stuff. So ultimately, they bring you to the to the punchline of this uh, is that a, a month ago or so, I started reading this book again, A Greater Psychology. Um, and so Sri Aurobindo is a great yogic philosopher. Um, and although I knew it, I just heard it so differently as he starts to open up. Uh, and he offers in this book a critique of psychology. Hey, you guys do the exterior thing. But actually, 2,500 years ago, we started attending to the interior. You know, um, and my own language system on mind is a way of saying this is sort of like uh, the way I define mind is like, hey, mind one is like animal behavior. Mind three is this justifying thing. And mind two is this epistemological portal that, you know, uh, has adverbial adjectival consciousness and, and is a witness function. And essentially, then it's like, oh, that's where we start as in yogic. You know, the yogic framing is to afford your capacity to create a feedback loop of witnessing the witness function and then engendering all sorts of um, psychotechnologies that afford the expansion of that and the affordance of self-world insight uh, in relationship to the practices of that. And then what happens to him in terms of like, okay, so through my own training and through other people who have this capacity to see the world, what do we get? Well, essentially what he articulates is just an unbelievable, for me now, it just sort of gives me chills. It's like, oh, actually there is the down from your standard mind, what he calls just standard ordinary mind, basically, into a vital capacity, which i.e. down into the sort of less conscient frames of biology. And then underneath that is an even less conscient material reality that then drops ultimately into an energy system, okay? And then through that, at the down, you then go up into a, a higher mind. And then he talks about an illuminative, an intuitive mind, and then ultimately an overmind sage-like view that then in its highest reaches touches a super mind uh, coming off of a particular contact with the divine. And, and then he looks, steps back and he says, hey, the consciousness, the cosmic conscious serener of the awakening the dimensionality of awakening from energy to matter to life to mind, and then ultimately into the over super mind creates this complexification view, and you create then a whole oneness of consciousness awakening. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so now this is the experience of, of course, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I can line that completely up with the imagery that imaginal. You know, we can get into the ontological and metaphysical commitments, but if at least if I'm reading Sri Aurobindo, while well, certainly he has contact with the divine and he may have more, well, he's just got, maybe he's just more advanced. He's got deeper ontological insights into the reality, but he's not clear on what it is at, at, a, at a deep metaphysical level, nor am I. And at the very least, the concept of it relative as its alignment is just enormously powerful, at least as far as I'm concerned in the alignment. So from my experience, here I am, experimental exterior behavior from the outside empiricism. You now have a whole tradition that actually knows that, eschews that in a particular way, drops into interior empiricism. And if we can build a metaphysics that actually aligns this continuum of awareness, whatever, from energy all the way up to the concept of God that affords a complexification that's both has an interior, exterior, and metaphysical coherence, then that's the kind of architecture that I think would at least provide some kind of container to deeply inform potential transformations along the lines that we've been discussing. Totally. That was great. So, I mean, oh, go ahead, John. Okay. Um, I, I'm not familiar with, what's the name again? Sri Arabando. And, right. and by the way, he is one of the most influential 
figures for Ken Wilber, just in terms of lineage. So Ken Wilber draws a lot of what he thinks about, and you know a lot more than I is about this act, but he, I certainly, my understanding is that Sri Aurobindo um, was one of the most influential figures I, I, for Ken Wilber. I think it's pronounced Aurobindo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, it shows you my ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Aurobindo. Yeah, he's a big influence on Ken and you know, I think probably millions of people around the world. We spoke about him in one of the prior yep. episodes. And so I like, alluded to it, and I definitely just want to take this opportunity to come back to it because it was very important yeah. to me. So, totally. so just to help me a little bit, I've heard the name. Um, and of course, I, I've read people within the yogic, some of the yogic traditions, um, and also tantric and Buddhist and Taoist. Um, and Neil, Plata I mean, what I'm sorry. And this has come out in the series that I've done with Zevi Slavin, and then the series I'm doing with Zevi Slavin and Guy Senthok, you know, a deep reflection on, we use this term and it's, it's, it's not a very helpful term, but it's the term that is sort of stuck. Uh, we use mysticism to describe this. The problem with the term is it can mean anything from a, a radical insight into the fundamental nature of reality to seeing fairies or, right? Mm -hmm. And so the term is really, really equivocal and imprecise, and it puts things together that often i would say don't properly belong together um and it doesn't make distinctions for example clear distinctions between unitive experiences and visionary experiences and prophetic experiences and so i just wanted to say that i'm using that term with a lot of reflective caution when i now ask this question is he properly understood given all of that caveat is, is he typically sorry, sorry i made a mistake not properly because i just said we may not be able to properly use that term. So I, I, I'm correcting myself. Is he typically understood as a mystic? Is that, is that, is that? Well, I'll put it this way, because I've had three uh, conversations with Zevi. So that's about six hours with Zevi, yeah. who's educated me about his very erudite powerful, perspective on powerful. powerful mysticism. And his, the YouTube channel that he leads is called Seekers of Unity. And so his yeah. fundamental issue is, to expand consciousness to essentially see non-dual, the non-dual real of no or known relations in whatever expansion would be. I read this book, but Christly, because of my conversations with Zevi, I was prepared to basically be like, oh my God, that's what Zevi's talking about. So there's a huge aspect of this book in my estimation that aligns directly uh, with Zevi Slavin's angle on the mystic tradition. Hmm. That, that's very good in the sense of being very helpful to me because as I mentioned, I had an extended series with uh, Zevi uh, on the cogn on cognitive science and mysticism and the deep connections uh, the, the, between the two of them. And this is a, a core dimension of my work. I even have run experiments on relationship between mystical experience and uh, meaning in life. And so uh, if, if, if what you've just said is true, and I have every reason to believe that it is, um, then that helps me understand what's being spoken of here and now the, the well i'll give you just one other example so yeah. the the guide much of the guiding idea is sort of the death of the ego in various ways the death of the under you know the self-narrating justifying at least some aspect of breaking that up and then achieving a, from zevi's discussion of he'll have you know that that um is another very very strong theme in relation yeah, it is, but it needs to be qualified. I've got a totally. video that I did with uh, Mark Miller, former student of mine and now colleague, and we're writing a paper together uh, on, you know, there's two death, there's two kinds, of, at least two kinds of deaths of the ego. There's a privative kind in which people are experiencing depersonalization, derealization, and that's traumatic and horrible. And then there's a superlative kind in which people go be somehow, they lose the sense of ego or self, and this is all contested we talked about that right and yep. that is somehow superlative what's interesting is because of some of the cognitive science that's emerged you know you can actually sort of look at what's happening in people and i'm not being a reductionist here but this is also pertinent evidence like the brain states in these two states are actually very different so right the way for example the insular cortex is, is correct is connected to the rest of the cortex is fundamentally different in these two situations so in depersonalization, you see the insula being sort of isolated in a radical way. And in these, these no self experiences, you see radical connectivity. There's radical connectivity. So one way of thinking about it is here's sort of the norm in which the insula is trying to 
match inner inner sensory motor prediction and outer sensory motor prediction right here's the norm and you can be below it with insufficient amount of connectivity but you can also be beyond it in a way that is somehow experienced uh, as uh, as profoundly good um, totally so, so the yeah, so I mean, from my vantage point, I, when I say ego, I'm different. I definitely differentiate, as you know, from our conversations, from the experiential yeah. self. So the experiential yeah. self's capacity for an intuitive self-world grip and the expansion of that to create connectivity that would be then mirrored in the ideally in a you know functional MRI or whatever, as opposed to the you know self-conscious narrator, the, the kind that, that dissipates when we have flow experience. Yeah, exactly. That, the flow know, experience. The, that that kind of dissolution of the hey, I need to be right and my justification system is right and my extreme rigidity propositional knowing that defends both my version of reality and that egoic friend and the more natural egoic pride uh, you know and the need to be uh, somebody special in relation. That's the that aspect of the ego I think virtually all mystics well, traditions and a wide, and certainly here, the the capacity to expand beyond that to become trans justificatory egoic in that regard is pretty. I would say is a pretty consistent uh, depiction. Yeah, and and, and I, I I I think that's exactly right. And what I'm interested in is the reason I pointed to the different in functionality is there's also a difference in in phenomenology. That's what I was trying to get with private right or, right superlative. See, so the depersonalization, although there's lots of similarities in the phenomenology, right? The depersonalization doesn't carry with it what I call ontonormativity, right? The, the, the superlative version carries with it ontonormativity, which is, and this goes back to what we were talking about last time. The ontonormative is people do this really bizarre thing, right? So normally people ground real in terms of the sort of maximal coherence, maximal like in pragmatic sense right mm -hmm. maximal coherence of intelligibility so people will typically say dreams aren't real because this doesn't fit into you know the intelligibility by which i make sense of the world etc cetera, etc cetera. or i took it you know that I, I i was drunk and that wasn't real because and what's really weird about these higher states of consciousness is people go into experiences they they've never had before because they're leaving behind the normalization of the of the nattering narrative ego they get these experiences that do not fit in that are are almost lacking in content and then they but they say this they say that is actually more real than all of this they reverse the judgment normally they use all of this to judge things and, and to either accept them or reject them they take that as a and they feel they're fully justified in taking that experience to reject or at least call into question and they don't and this is not just statements i mean the research shows that what they do is they attempt to transform their relationships their roles their identity their understanding of the world so they can com in come into increasing conformity to the onto normative to the really real and that goes back to what i was saying before about like the, re totally. the really real the realness is this er thing at which you ought and this is the way it is they, they, they come together in a profound way. And the mystical experience, I'm arguing now, I'm making an argument, is exactly the experience in, when the, in which that er, that, that underlying oneness is exemplified in a way that drives people into profound transformation. I 100% agree. I'll shut up in a sec, but I'll just, yeah. I'll just echo that. Because for me then, what you're in your language, what we basically, what emerges is a new schematic of the, perspectival participatory intuitive grip of the world and then and then yeah. that grounds people in a in, in is a phase shift that affords a new transformation in that intuition and that is i mean we're, we're primates that are fundamentally anchored to that and then when people feel that uh that that speaks to them across multiple levels of being exactly and uh, and then I'll, I'll reply to that and then i'll let zach because so the basic proposal I've been making and why you see this kind of connectivity and, and kind of thing going on, and it's on the same continuum with flow and, in, and insight. I think flow is an insight cascade. I've got work on that. But the, the point I'm making is, like, for, so, so think about it this way. Normally when we flow, we flow in a, a limited domain. Flow is, you, you have to have skills, like, right? And, and you have to have sort of expertise uh, to get into the flow state. 
And so normally flow is localized and then you can get practices that generalize, but here's a proposal. What if you got sort of flow at the level of, uh, of sort of meta optimal grip? You're not flowing on how to get an optimal grip in biology or how to get an optimal grip in this relationship, right? But because you've got that ability, right? Either spontaneously or through training, what you're doing is actually the expertise you're flowing in is your capacity for optimal gripping per se. And that's why it's this profound sense of unity, intelligibility, enhancement, fundamental insight. And if that, and that's a proposal, by the way, I'm not stating it as fact, right? But it, it, it's, it's, it's evidence-based and theory-based. What that means is that there is, like there's a justification for that because insofar as local flow, it's pretty clear now is optimal performance in both senses of the word. People say, this is the greatest, this is the best I feel, and this is the best I practice. We know that flow is designating, no, is it designating it perfectly? But not, no, but nothing does. So that's not, a, but, but it, it, it reliably designates optimal experience and performance. Well then this, uh, the, right, right? The mystical totally. experience, the higher state of consciousness is similarly justifying, right? People's claim that they are in a kind of profound, optimal experience and performance with respect to reality. And, and so although they may spew very different metaphysical claims, the claim that they're somehow now enhancing religio in a way that reliably improves their lives, makes them wiser, I think that can be actually justified. Totally agree. Zach? Sorry, Zach, that was a bit <laughs> no, of a speech, no, no. but I was trying to lay out an argument. Fascinating, fascinating conversation. I mean, this is actually one of my wheelhouses because I've really cut my teeth on Ken Wilber and he really addressed a lot of these problems I think really well like in the 70s and, and 80s and and you're right Greg that Orbindo was a was a very big influence on Ken but it's interesting to note that there's like a there's a history of this conversation in western psychology of course mm -hmm. William James yes. like variety yep, yep, of religious yep, experience yep. of course is the place yep. where this kind of begins and of course uh Orbindo was a mystic absolutely I'll get to that but he also read James, read Darwin, <laughs> and was yeah. educated in England. And uh, him and this guy, Vivekananda, who you guys might know, who at the Parliament of World Religions, who met William James, who brought Hinduism to the West and was the first time that you had this kind of fusion. And there's other, other places too. When the British got up into Tibet and you had this infusion, but you get this meeting of quote unquote East and West, right? Mm -hmm. And so like there's this lineage between Orbindo and Vivekananda in particular. And it's that huh. same attempt that Orbindo is trying to do is bring the East and the West, quote unquote, together. Um, Orbindo was a political radical during the okay. occupation of India by the mm. British. And before Gandhi was organizing guerrilla warfare, was in prison for a bomb plot in isolation, had a vision of Vivekananda who came huh. to him. Uh, so we'll talk about visions. We'll talk about mm -hmm. yeah. non- yeah non-conceptual awareness, yep. right? um, higher states of consciousness versus just altered states of consciousness. So there's yep. a lot of distinctions there and uh -huh. can, can help there. But so Orbindo goes on to, you know, flee to French India, um, would later say that during the time that he was agitating, guerrilla warfare made sense. But when Gandhi, by the time Gandhi got to it, then Gandhi was appropriate. And so, uh -huh. you know, um, in any case, the point I'm making here is that he was trying to bridge East and West. So he was trying to do like Vivekananda. He was trying to say, you guys think you do science? We do a deeper science. Yeah. <laughs> and yep. we've been doing it for thousands of years. It was part of a, the a greater psychology. It was, it, was part of the, it was part of the Bengal Renaissance. It was part of the encounter of the British with not Native Americans, but with the Indian subcontinent, which had uh -huh. civilizations that had been living on it with high culture and mathematics and all of these things. Right. And so there was this encounter, which resulted in the Bengal Renaissance and Aurobindo, Ramakrishna and Ramana Maharshi among Vivekananda and others are like these key figures where like Jung and other people are like, whoa, <laughs> what are those guys doing? And, and James similarly. And you know, Orbindo makes this argument, like, listen, the, it's the interior sciences. Ken picks this up and we're, we're working this with Gaffney and then in the neo-perennialism that, you know, the argument against it is that, well, you know, your subjective experience and my subjective experience are different. 
And Orbindo is like, mm, not if you're meditating well <laughs> and you're working with the, and, and you're working with a community of practitioners who are all meditating in the same way. And you're talking about your practice. And so right. Orbindo tries to paint this picture of a kind of like verifiableism within the domain of interiority through collective communities of practice. Mm -hmm. Ken kind of plugs right in there and he says, there's a broad empiricism again, echoing William James Wilbur. And he's saying, listen, like anything that is disclosed in first person experience and verified in third person experience and second person experience, which is yeah, I mean, yep. logical. Yep. We're getting into now something that fits these definitions of real. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. So once, yeah. so once you get the opening of the interior sciences and you say, Hey, actually those dudes in Tibet were doing something really cool. They weren't innovating and like building bombs and stuff, <laughs> but they were going so deep inside with such rich community practice that they must've discovered something that's true about the nature of reality and at least the human mind. Right. And so Aurobindo was basically saying, hell yeah, we did. And there's a, there's a very rich architecture of mental phenomena that's discoverable from these interior sciences and their rigorous practices. Um, and so this results in, uh, it's interesting. So again, James picks up a little bit on this with the broad mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, the history of, of the kind of like diversity of religious experience that once you start to study this stuff, then it's just the gates open. <laughs> Right, yeah. and this yeah. is like the problem with psi phenomenon and all of that stuff is that like it's actually kind of a Pandora's box ontologically, yep. so it gets very difficult mm -hmm. to handle some of these phenomena, and uh, and so that's why Orbindo's like, well, that's why you need to change your ontology. <laughs> You're not going to be able to understand these things, and so he posits the ontology downward, as you postulated, Greg, matter, life, mind, but then he also posits the ontology upward. Yep. And here's where we get the full kind of neoplatonic great yep. chain of being that Aurobindo <laughs> lays on its side. And he's saying like Tilia de Chardin that like the future is reaching back mm -hmm. and bringing us forward. So there's all of these crazy assumptions, which actually, when you really look at cosmological evolution, it's pretty weird and based on a lot of crazy assumptions. <laughs> Aurobindo seemed crazy because he drew them from the interior sciences. Yep. Is it any more crazy than the statements? But anyway, so I'm not going to get into that debate, but so, but in any case, Orbindo was prolific. And so Greg, I would encourage you to read. I spent many years just really mm. engaging with the work. And mm -hmm. so, but yeah. I'm now so about the, a third of the way through Life Divine. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm getting into it. Yep. And, the, and so the, but the thing I wanted to bring up here was to John's point of like mysticism being very poorly defined. And, mm -hmm. and there's a way, and there's a few people, Wilbur being the main one, who tried to build taxonomies mm -hmm. of these forms. Um, yep. And it's important to get it right because like, just like there's the derealization and then there's the like egoless awareness, there's also like, you know, psychotic visions and... Yep religious visions right and then uh and so and you can go on to see that there's like these interesting cleavings in the landscape of mental phenomenon once you start to look at these kinds of mental phenomena and it's important to note that there's looks like in a lot of the meditative literatures that describe increasing attainments of meditative capacity you have vertical stacks sometimes called state stages, yeah. which unfold by sequence and you can't get to one without getting to the other one first, right? So the, those types of phenomenon occur and appears in meditative attainment. But then there's obviously other cases where you're not going through anything. Boom, something <laughs> just happened and your state is completely altered, right? Those have the quality of being, you're dropped into complete egolessness or complete concept less awareness languageless awareness sometimes it's dark or light or undescribable so uh wilbur calls this the causal uh the unmanifest and then there's other ones that happen in a flash that are actually rich with imaginal content <laughs> right um and this is a different orbinda would say a different realm 
And so there's this way of trying to think about how do we organize these experiences? And it begins, I think, back with Elaid with the book mysticism, where there's like the nature mysticism and the theistic mm-hmm. mysticism, and then the, the non-theistic mysticism. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, nature mysticism, you're un- you don't drop your senses and sense of self. You're empowered by your unity with nature. And then you feel oneness with the web of life. And you mm-hmm. kind of like, you're still Zach, but now you're in a way not Zach, but you're uh-huh. reading and looking and you're speaking. It's nature right. unity mysticism. But then the theistic mysticism is different. That's an encounter with a non-human intelligence, right. <laughs> a, a vow type encounter, yep. Yep. which is very common in mystical experience of the kind where there's visionary intrusion and other things where you're uh-huh. actually communicating with non-human intelligence. So theistic we'll call broadly, but there's other forms, you know, or angelology, demonology, et cetera, non-human intelligent mystical experience. And then there's just the, like I said, the unmanifest face before your parents were born. Uh, mm. causal awareness deep dreamless sleep um, mm-hmm. that all of those are in play in orbindo's mysticism mm-hmm. and he stacks them like this <laughs> where you move out of the mental into a form of nature mysticism into a form of theistic mysticism into a form of unmanifest mysticism and then at the top of that the whole thing grabs in the non-dual um, uh, which is his move back down so he's not yep. escaping up and out He's saying we need to actually bring the full stack into material reality, which means actually literally transforming the nature of my own cellular material by being in touch with the super mind. So mm-hmm. this is really like, oh, that's a weird thing to bring to a psychology conference now, Greg. But, <laughs> right, right. Well, stand, I don't talk to psychology. You stand up to the APA and say that. And so this is the thing is like, once you break into the interior sciences, the claims made by these traditions about what's discoverable within the interior sciences are as radical as the claims made by those physicists <laughs> who talk about the Big Bang and who talk about string theory and stuff that we actually really don't understand, even though we think they're the smartest guys on the planet and ask them about moral and ethical and religious things. And why do we do that? They're physicists, right? But these interior sciences guys who've worked for, you know, sometimes in decades <laughs> in communities of practice for centuries tell us all kinds of stuff. And so this gets back to the imaginal work that reveals true reality um, and how do we tell the difference? And so there's massive controversy about all of these guys that I mentioned involved with the Bengal Renaissance um, or Bindo, in, in controversy in the sense of like, well, from a scientific perspective, they're all charlatans, mm. right? From a scientific perspective, they're resuscitating ignorant religion and et cetera, right? So the defense of the interior sciences against the quote exterior sciences and the legitimation of it is, was the main thing that Ken Wilbur was trying to do in his yep. career, basically. He was trying to say, hey guys, science is awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. But this stuff that we do in meditation and the religious geniuses, right? The Orbindo, I would say, mm-hmm. is a religious genius. Um, mm-hmm. Religious geniuses are coming up with stuff that we need to take as seriously mm-hmm. as we're taking stuff like physics, for example, mm-hmm. or as we're taking the reductive you know, right. psychology and comparative psychology and things like mm-hmm. that. And, you know, and Maslow is in the mix there with his self-actualizing and peak experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's been some conversation, but there's been no way to bring some of this quote unquote evidence to bear <laughs> because it's non-admissible uh, in the court of public opinion and especially scientific orthodoxy. And so that has always been this issue of why Ken, for example, sits on the edges of the academy yep. was dismissed. Uh, when in fact he's done some of the most rigorous work <laughs> on exactly these precise issues around mysticism uh-huh. and, and uh, transformative experience, religious movement, things of that nature. Um, so yeah, so I, I second your and applaud your pursuit of Aurobindo. And I'm curious to see how you bring him in <laughs> to mainstream psychology journals in a, in a serious way where it's not just a curiosity from another culture, uh-huh. but actually, no, we take Aurobindo's writing seriously in the way that we trade for example, like, you know, a, a study seriously where some dude made up a metric of a bunch of Likert items and created a right. concept, publishes it. And they're like, oh, that's real science. Or Bindo who takes a lifetime writing of books <laughs> and doing like, we're talking, when I'm talking like a casual meditator. <laughs> no, <laughs> And that's clear. the other thing to remember here is like, you read or Bindo, you think you get it, but mm, probably not. Like that's a mental projection of an experience which you haven't had the years of meditation and practice in religious community to attain the kinds of insights that Orbindo is speaking about are also in the model of intersubjective confirmation of first person experience. It has to be a community of the adequate. Yep. So if you've been meditating for 20 years 
and you start to have meditative experiences and you go to your colleagues who've never meditated and you say, hey, I had this experience. There, there's no way for them to understand what the hell you're talking about. If you go to other meditators, even in other traditions who have meditated for as long as seriously, and you describe that experience, you usually can start to be like, oh, that's it. And you can start to talk about your shared experience of the first person phenomenon to get at this reality, which is what the inner sciences are trying to discover. Um, so yeah, there's this, there's this tricky moves that need to be made to reintroduce some of these as valid trajectories of exploration. Again, I think Maslow is worth mentioning here because this is about... Oh, no. This is about the advances in positive psychology. <laughs> yeah, book I'm reading right. Other book is Transcend by Scary. Yeah, see what that's like. Updated. Uh, this is it's an that, interesting anyway, update about. Anyway. Yeah, there's issues with that book too, because or because he's trying to resolve it in a non-religious manner. So, <laughs> whereas so, Orbindo says there's no other solution but to do it. Right. In a religious manner. Yeah. Well, that that to me is, I mean, this is just right on the sort of the doorstep of what's from my at least where I am in terms of what I'm metabolizing. Uh, but what I wanted us to sort of you know, sort of end with at least is a emerging architecture that afforded perhaps a new opportunity to build the exterior classic science, modern empirical natural science view of the world uh, with an interior uh, view. And that's essentially what my own at least experience was where I'm sitting at least with you talk as a capacity to begin to build. And of course the work that I'm doing with John and you and, and all of this is like, no, okay, yeah, it's, it's, tough and there's a lot of things to be sorted out, but damn, if there isn't an outline uh, that is beginning to emerge out of the fog that would afford um, a degree of coherence. Uh, and we can see about what ontological commitments that that would entail, but in relationships to sort of just a, a broad swath of conscious awareness in the universe and what that would mean across particular kinds of identifiable dimensions. I don't know, I'm fucking seeing that on the horizon. So my um, entry into this, because I said I don't know this work in particular, but I was, uh, I, my entry is the Kyoto School. Nishida was profoundly influenced by James um, and also by Heidegger and then Nishitani. Um, and that was also the attempt to bridge uh, between the East and West. And I've been following the Kyoto School for quite some time. <clears throat> and the issue of intelligibility, for example, comes out in Nishida's work. Um, and then the other, the tradition is, uh, you know, that is the Neoplatonic tradition because in Neoplatonism, there was a time in which the, 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 the meditative or meditative contemplative uh, uh, practices and the, you know, the, the, the philosophical scientific practice of trying to make sense of reality were deeply interpenetrating and mutually supporting. So our, our, our view are almost, uh, I would say prejudice that they have to be in an antagonistic relationship is just not true to history. And it's, all, it's also not true cross-contextually, cross-culturally. So just that, I wanted to put that on the table that our presumption that the relationship has to be antagonistic is exactly that. It's an unjustifiable given history and cross-cultural investigation. It's an unjustifiable presumption. Now that doesn't mean we come up with a solution, but just digging in your heels and say, no, no, never, that, that's an unjustifiable stance, as far as I can tell. Well, just at a personal narrative, you know, the the at least in October when I had a, you know, perhaps my, you know, well, however, where the hell it is on some stack, I don't know. But basically, I dropped, as you know, John, I dropped into that particular, and that was actually afforded to a particular angle on what the universe was as a beam of energy information that I put my consciousness in particular lens with, and then actually my justification system dropped out, and I'm like. Oh my God, I'm feeling wisdom energy. And then I'm just going to go for a walk. Remember, John, I was texting yeah, and all that, you know, right? And then you were like, hey, that's kind of like chi, right? And yes, it was like, yes. you know, I mean, that to me is like, hey, the, the, at least at a phenomenological subjective version of reality, it's like, damn. I mean, there's something there. Well, that, well, thank you for that, Greg. That's, and I, I was, I'm, and I got to participate in it. But I, I'm going to try and circle this around because I yep. think. I think so. I, I, I was pointing towards the, the mystical experience, mystical realization. I, I prefer using mystical realization over mystical experience uh, for some of the reasons. So, there's mystical realization points to this, you know, the, the, the Tao point where the is and the ought are, 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 are indistinguishable 
uh, because they come from a common origin, right? The realness, the ontonormativity, all that stuff. But correspondingly to that, um, and this was, I think, really well articulated in um, Neoplatonism, the work of Pearl, P-E-R-L, really brings this out on Neoplatonism, um, is the idea that we have, a, what we abandon in modernity, that there are truths and not, and this doesn't mean propositional, truths are meant as ways in which we couple to reality and we and reality are more able to disclose who we are and what reality is. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about totally. truth here, almost in the sense of betrothed, right? the, one of the original etymologies for truth, troth, right? right? The idea that there are truths that are only accessible after we undergo significant transformation, right? And that's part of what's been driving our whole conversation here. Totally. The, 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 you know, the, the, I don't know what to call it, the, 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 the proposal, uh, you know, typified in Descartes that no, no, all you need is a method, right? A method and that will be universally applied. And that, so transformation loses its ontological significance, right? It loses its, it's, it's good. the idea that there are aspects, the, I'll use the matter, I don't like inner and outer, but I'll use it right now, right? There, right, there, there are way, there are dimensions of the inner world and the outer world that are not disclosable unless those two have gone through transformation in some deeply coupled fashion. That's, you know, that's the main, that's the driving engine in Plotinus's argument. It's like, you, you, you can't, this deeper level of reality is inaccessible to you until you've gone through these transformations and you can't do these transformations like independently from the way in which reality, you're participating in reality. I, and for me, I mean, that was one of the reasons, uh, you know, I, 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 I wanted to engage in this project because I mean, what we keep coming back to and, you know, and, and, and both of you, Zach and Greg, you, you like you in different ways you have, I think made this point, which is no, no, like you, you, you really can't get at, um, you know, what we are and what our relationship to reality is and what reality is without undergoing transformation. And I think the mystical tradition is the main source of evidence broadly construed for exactly that claim. And what we have to remember is cross-culturally and cross-historically, cross that has been taken very, very seriously. It's like, yeah, yeah, well, deeper aspects of reality or deeper knowledge of myself, I can't get that unless I go through some huge transformation. And we replace that with, no, 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 I don't need to change. I just need to use this method and it will take mm -hmm. me to the depths of me and to the depths <laughs> of reality. And I think what fascinates me about the mystical tradition is it's kind of living proof that that Cartesian proposal is ultimately incomplete. I'm not saying that, you know, we can't use methods and the scientific methods, there's more than one, by the way, the scientific methods are very powerful. But the idea that we don't, that the, 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 the mystical proposal, the mystical exemplification is, no, no, your fundamental access to reality within and without is dependent on transformation in a profound way. And that is, you know, precisely, I think, at, at, I think that's where our conversation about transformation and mysticism are meeting for me. That's how I'm seeing the relationship between them. Yes, no, totally. And that's what Aurobindo would say. Again, he's compared to Plotinus because he's, he's got the hierarchy of knowing and being, and you can only get an experience of that being if you move up this hierarchy yep, of, yep, of yep. knowing. And they're, they're, and they're completely coupled. And yeah, it's, it's interesting the the way that notion transformed with the onset of modernity. You know, yeah. that there wasn't an absence of the notion; it just kind of went underground because you yes. still had, you yeah. still had science, like especially nowadays, this notion of an expert, <laughs> right? <Yeah. clears throat> Which is someone who, by that definition, kind of knows something you don't know by virtue of like putting in ten thousand hours or whatever the technical definition is. So this notion of epistemic yeah. asymmetry, epistemic asymmetry as related to teacherly authority is one ah, of the right. things to worry about yeah. a lot. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a very interesting problem and the, and the root of, of transformation. Uh, and so like, you know, the, the, well, there's several things to say here. One is that there's, there's a difficulty in it because 
the, the very, because you can transfer, as we've talked about, you can move through transformative processes uh, that do disclose realities, but narrow, limited bandwidth realities. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like saying, listen, you're going to transform, you're going to develop, that's going to disclose more reality. So pay attention <laughs> to how you're transforming and developing, because that will literally become what you are and know and, and feel with, with your being. And so this is the deep philosoph like philosophy of education question. Learning is inevitable. <laughs> if you spend all day playing video games, you will learn to become extremely good at video games, right? Like don't pretend that's not going to happen. And similarly, if you just learn what they tell you in school, then you'll just be really good at what they tell you in school. <laughs> so there's this question about <clears throat> like, you know, once you move out of a psychology that's static and move into one that's diachronic and move into one that's about learning fundamentally over being our static trait, then you have to start being much more concerned about amelioration of behavior. Uh, yeah. and change yeah. of behavior and education of behavior because if it's like oh your iq is that at 10 that's what you are kid like that's a static non-diachronic way of characterizing a trait oh you're introverted okay that doesn't change you know like and so there's this way that the non-diachronic psychologies make us inattentive to how rich the transformative nature of the experience is and how ontologically world the worlding that comes from it right yeah, to get to good yeah, that yeah. like there's this like yeah. unfolding of greater worldedness um and so yeah that's directly tied to that i mean this is kind of the whole theme that we've been talking about yep All the and way lots of actually I, and, and even an ironic twist the nature of reliability and validity in measurement <laughs> basically creates realities that are essentially then are translated as fixed because this is the reality that you can document and translate across generalizability. Uh, so the it, one of the interesting things in about measurement is finding the things that are reliably measured, which then they don't change. Anyway, that's a I know we're running low on time. No, you're right, and that's, that's like a, again the, fascinating the codification of. of measurement as the dominant professionalization modality of psychology led to the reification of these mongrel concepts that are anyway. So this is fascinating. Well, I'm going to draw it to a close because yes. I think we, 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 we've, uh, we've uh, like, uh, I feel like we are, are now resonating like almost holographically through the whole of the, our dialogue together. And that's a good thing. My intuitive so, grip on the world. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to thank you both for this, uh, this wonderful journey we've taken together. Genuine Dialogos, you know, where I feel I got to places I couldn't get to on my own. And I hope the two of you found that as well. And for me, that's one of the defining criteria uh, for genuine dialogos. And so, if you have any, uh, you know, uh, I'm, re I'm really glad we had this. This is what I was. This last session, in particular, you know, in terms of the uh, the description of an architecture of metapsychology around a logos that then bridges in terms of its potential of, of making associations, and then really a potentially emerging coherence that can really, um, you know, be up to the task, true to human transformation. I, I think we've, you know, the, the, I see an outline for that in this deal logos and I'm deeply grateful. Yeah, I'm just grateful and kind of honored to be just chatting with you guys about this stuff. It was, felt very productive. And uh, and then also like something you do for its own sake. So it was a good, yep. it was a good experience. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm going to uh, end the recording mm -hmm. and uh, we'll, we'll all talk again soon, no doubt. Later.